Hi, uh, welcome to this module on informed consent process. Um, I am Vijay Prasad, I am um, assistant professor in community medicine at the ESIC Medical College in KK Nagar, Chennai. In this session, we will try and explain the informed consent process. How is the informed consent actually administered? We will eva evaluate what are those research projects for which informed consent is required and what are those projects for which it can be waived. And finally, we will go through two case studies, analyze the content of the information sheet and consent form for completeness and appropriateness. First, let us go through the various steps in the process of administering an informed consent. First and foremost thing that has to be kept in mind in the process of administering an informed consent is to assess the capacity of the research participant to give the consent. And as we have seen in the previous uh, session on informed consent, the capacity is determined by the age of the participant, it is uh, determined by the mental capacity of the participant, whether they are, uh, they are suffering from any mental disabilities. It is also decided by whether they are conscious, unconscious and the general uh, thinking ability of the participant. The other important thing that has to be kept in mind before starting the informed consent process is to assess whether there are any undue inducements, whether there is any duress, whether there is coercion in the process, whether it is possible for the participant to give a free and full voluntary informed consent that has to be borne in mind. And in case the participant is not legally capable of providing a consent or if the participant is medically incapacitated from providing an informed consent because of either mental disability or unconsciousness, it has to be ensured that there is a legally acceptable representative who can give the consent on behalf of the participant. And it has to be ensured that this informed consent process is administered before the start of any procedure in the research project. So, this should be the first step in the entire research process. The consent form should be in the language of the participant. It should be, uh, it, uh, when I say language, it is not just the vernacular, it is not just um, Hindi or Tamil or Telugu or Malayalam. It is all, also about the easy way of understanding of the language. It is not just about the language, it is also about the words that are used, the phrases that are used and whether it is in a one, uh, uh, colloquial uh, style which anybody can understand. Simple words have to be there in the informed consent process and short sentences should be featured. It should be overall easy to understand and as part of administering the informed consent, the co information sheet of the informed consent form has to be read out to the participant and if they are capable of reading, they should also read the inform information sheet. The information provided in the information sheet and that which is told to the participant has to be not only scientifically accurate, it has to be socially and culturally appropriate and acceptable. It cannot have aspects which are looked down upon culturally and socially. Then measures has to be taken to ensure adequate comprehension of the content. For example, if the participants in a research project are uh, people who, ha who have visual disability, then the, the informed consent document has to be in braille or if they uh, have limited ability to read and write, the informed consent should be in the form of pictures, graphics, illustrations, etc. And in case of uh, administering informed consent to children, it would be good to have video clippings, illustrations, colorful pictures to explain the process of the study. And wherever appropriate, after administering the information to the participant, test of comprehension should be done. That is, uh, certain questions should be posed, so that the researcher can understand whether the participant has understood the various aspects of the informed consent. As seen previously, 
providing adequate time for comprehension processing of the information is very important. Informed consent cannot be a process which is done in a haste. Uh, it cannot be something where within a very short duration of time the whole thing gets over and the patient participant just signs and starts uh, participating in the study. Substantial time has to be provided. Ideally, the participant should be given the information sheet to take home, discuss with the friends, discuss with family and then come back with the decision. The participant and those who are interested in their welfare should read the information sheet, should understand the various aspects that are provided in the information sheet. The other important thing is that adequate time should be provided for interaction between the researcher and the participant, where the researcher asks questions related to participation in the study. Their doubts are clarified. So, all this obviously takes a lot of time and therefore, informed consent process has to be uh, a process in which time is invested sig significantly. The informed consent process, during the process, the researcher should also ensure and assure the page participant that if they refuse to participate, there will not be any adverse consequences to them. It will not hamper their rights, it will not deny their entitlements and it will not affect the physician patient relationship if the researcher themselves are the physicians, uh, uh, primary physicians of the participant. So, these assurances have to be provided. This is in order to make them or ensure that the consent given is a voluntary consent. Then the documentation of the informed consent happens by uh, putting the signature of the participant. The participant has to sign. In case the participant is somebody who lacks the ability to read or write, then the left thumb impression has to be placed and this when a left thumb impression is being placed uh, in, instead of a signature this has to be witnessed by an impartial third party. An eyewitness has to be there when the thumbprint is being uh, uh, placed in the informed consent document. This eyewitness should witness the entire process of administration of the consent. It is not just witnessing the signature, but the entire process. And in case the participant is legally or medically incapable of providing consent, uh, either they are unconscious or they are they do not have the mental ability then legally acceptable representatives can uh, sign on their behalf to include them in the research study and in case the legally acceptable representative also cannot read and write in case they are also depositing their uh, uh, thumb impression on, uh, on behalf of their signature then that also that process also has to be eyewitnessed in case of institutionalized participants like participants of uh, say a prison, participants from a prison or participants from uh, uh, a school, a residential school, then permission from the head of the institution is also important. They also have to sign the document giving their permission for the wards of their institution to participate in the study. There are certain situations where informed consent can be waived. Let us look at some of the circumstances where informed consent is waived. Firstly, there are some situations where there is scientific necessity that you cannot take informed consent. One such example is where you are doing an observational study of say um, hand washing practices among nurses in a intensive care unit. So, if you explain that such a study is being done and if you take a consent from these nurses, it will obviously change their behaviors. So, it is not possible to conduct a scientific research if you get an informed consent. In those situations, the ethics committee can decide to waive the informed consent. The other situation is when the data that is being used for analysis in the project are all de-identified and de-linked data which cannot be traced back to the origin. These are usually secondary data that are uh, part of large databases and when they are adequately de-identified and they are adequately de-linked from the source, then informed consent may be waived. Research on anonymized biological samples like uh, uh, unlinked anonymous testing for uh, HIV AIDS, 
was a, uh, is a very popular uh, practice. In those situations, when there is a uh, delinking between the specimen and the individual who gave the specimen, then informed consent may be waived. And in certain types of public health research, the enormity of the number of participants often precludes the possibility of obtaining an informed consent. Uh, for example, in surveillance programs, in uh, 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 syndromic surveillances and in program evaluations, it is often not possible to get individual informed consents. And also in certain other public health research, let us say for example, uh, research of a new method of water purification is done in a village. It is not meaningful for one household in the village to say I will not consume that water. It is not meaningful for them to deny consent. So, in those situations informed consent may be waived. Then research which is done on data that is available in the public domain. In those situations also informed consent is waived. And uh, finally, informed consent may be waived where the immediacy of the problem is there. That is research has to be done in an urgent situation like for example, in a humanitarian crisis. Research which is done during disaster situations. In these situations again, informed consent may be waived. But this decision of waiver of the informed consent is something which has to be made by the ethics committee. Then there are some situations where uh, the consent has to be re-administered or a fresh informed consent may have to be administered during the process of the research study. For example, uh, some new information may have uh, become uh, come to light during the process of the research in the uh, area of study and it may be important for the participants to know about this new information. In that case, a re-administration of consent becomes important. This is again a decision that the ethics committee has to make. Then if a research participant who enrolled who was previously unconscious has become conscious during the course of the study, then uh, the consent has to be administered or in case a person uh, who was previously mentally incapable of providing consent has regained insight due to treatment, then they again, uh, there again informed consent has to be re-administered. Sometimes the research project may be so long that a child who originally enrolled in the project may actually become an adult during the course of the study. In that case again informed consent may have to be re-administered to that child who became an adult. And there may be long term follow up studies like long term cohort studies in which extensions may have to be required and uh, updates may have to be provided to the participants. In those cases also re-administration of informed consent is important. And if there is any change in the study protocol, if there are any alterations, again informed consent may have to be re-administered. And if there is possibility of disclosure of the identity of a participant during an upcoming publication, within a short period of time, a publication is coming up and it is possible that the identity of the participant may directly or indirectly be revealed in the process of that publication, then informed consent specifically for that publication may become uh, required in that case. This usually happens in long term cohort studies. So, these are situations where re-consenting or re-administration of a fresh informed consent becomes necessary during the course of a research project. Now, let us take two case study examples and let us go through these ex uh, informed consent documents and see what are the elements which are present, what are the elements which are lacking and how to make a judgment about the appropriateness of the informed consent as an ethics committee member. So, the first example we, which we will see is actually an incomplete and inaccurate informed consent document. We will go through it and see how to identify these inaccuracies and incompleteness. So, this is a study. Uh, this is the first page of the informed consent document, you can go through it. This is a study which looks at access and utilization of the Janani Shishu Suraksha Karyakrama services, identifying best practices and in innovations in a particular state in India. I am blacking out the name of the state for uh, purposes of confidentiality. So, this is the first paragraph of the inform information sheet as you can see where the researcher has provided details about the Janani Shishu Suraksha Karyakrama. What is this Karyakrama? How does this Karyakrama provide 
absolutely no cost treatment or absolutely no cost delivery services from ambulance service to uh, food and uh, in uh, non medical costs coverage within the hospital and dropping them back to the home after the delivery so that details are provided in the first paragraph of the informed consent form then you can see in the second paragraph the researcher has stated the purpose of the study so the researcher states you are being invited to participate in a research study so they have made a declaration that it is a research study they have made a very clear declaration that it is a research study so that is a good point here and then they go on to state the purpose of the study in which they say to assess access and utilization of jssk services and out of pocket expenditure you can see very clearly here that lot of jargon has been used this is probably something which only a technical person can understand for a participant coming from rural area in a remote uh, district in a state in india making a statement like access and utilization of jssk services and out of pocket expenditure may not be very comfortable to understand so this uh, explanation of purpose of the study needs to be simplified and it has to be restated in a different manner probably the the researcher could have said uh, the purpose of the study is to understand how women access this J, uh, program where complete free treatment for delivery is provided by the government uh, within brackets they could have called given the name of the program and they could they could have also avoided the use of the word out of pocket expenditure and said how uh, spending from their own money is a problem that is the purpose of this study to understand the problem of spending their own money for delivering in a government health facility so this purpose of the study in this uh, informed consent document has been written in a very complicated language which definitely difficult to understand now moving on to the next paragraph in this the author uh, or the researcher actually describes the procedure of the study so you can go through the description uh, the uh, pr uh, researcher says we intend to conduct a total of 50 52 interviews fgds case studies from the selected four phcs from selected two districts again this sentence is filled with uh words and phrases which a common person cannot understand somebody without a sound grasp of research methods will not be able to understand what uh fgd is what a case study is etc so this has to be broken down into simple layman language ideally the procedure has to be described something like this the researcher should have said uh, as part of this study we will be talking to you one on one or we will be collecting a group of people and having a discussion about this particular program we will be talking about your experiences of delivering a baby in the hospital we will be asking you specific questions about how much you spent whether you utilized the free service why you utilize how was it easy for you to utilize the service was it difficult for you what were the difficulties you faced if you phrase this entire procedure in this manner it would have been very easy for the participant to understand and comprehend the nature of the research that is very difficult here because the way the procedures have been described is very technical and very difficult for a lay person to understand moving on the researcher has made a statement of risks of participation so you can see the researcher says there are no major risks included in this study period again this is a gross underestimation of risk uh in a subsequent session on risk and benefit analysis it will be spoken or it will be emphasized that there is no research project which is free of risks so this kind of a statement where no major risks involved in the study is not a true statement and this cannot be uh, placed in an informed consent document then the the researcher makes a statement about benefits in the next page you can see uh no direct benefits can be generated uh, guaranteed to your uh, by your participation in this research study that is what the researcher has said again this is another statement which just absolves themselves of guaranteeing any uh, benefits but 
there is a benefit of their participation in the study to the larger community, to the la program at large and that benefit of their participation to the larger community and to the program has to be mentioned because that may motivate some people to participate in the study. That information is not provided in this consent form. Then they have made a statement about confidentiality which again is a good statement. They said, they, they have said your identity will be completely kept confidential which is a good thing to do. So, that is a good practice that they have followed in this informed consent form. Then there are certain elements which are absent in this informed consent form. They are conspicuous by its absence and these are uh, contact details of the researcher. What are the contact, who is the researcher, who is the point of contact if the participant has any doubts or questions, what is their address, what is their phone number, those details are not provided in this informed consent sheet and there is no statement anywhere in the informed consent form that participation is completely voluntary that they can refuse to participate without any consequences, they can withdraw from the study at any point without stating a reason, these statements are not present in this informed consent form. So, that is a big flaw in this informed consent document. So, that is uh, so far what we have seen is the information sheet part of the uh, document. Now comes the consent form part of the document. Again, the consent form has to provide under what conditions this consent is being provided. That is after completely reading the uh, information sheet or after somebody read the information sheet to the participant, after completely understanding the various aspects of the participation in the research project, after understanding that it is completely voluntary and there is no undue coercion, there is no force, there is no pressure, the participant has to give the consent. So, those conditions have to be specifically specified or mentioned in the consent form part of the document that is not present in this case. So, these, this is a typical example of an inappropriate consent form uh, which can be improvised based on these comments. So, the ethics committee has to go through the informed consent form and identify these deficits like how we have just done now. Now, let us go through another example, the second case study of a correct and well drafted informed consent document. So, we will be able to compare head to head with the previous incorrect and poorly drafted informed consent form. So, let us go through the consent uh, participant information sheet. You can see that this is a study to assess the association between receiving government scholarship for medical education and future career trajectories. This is somebody is uh, embarking on a study like this. So, you can see that this entire informed consent document starts with details of the investigator, who is the, the name of the investigator, the address, the email ID and the phone number are provided very clearly. Again here it is, uh, I, have, I have changed all the name and details here to pr uh, preserve the confidentiality, but actually the original details are provided in this informed consent document. Then there is a declaration that this is a research study. The first statement of the document itself says that you are invited to participate in this research project. So, there is a clear declaration that it is a research study. Then there are in the first paragraph of the informed consent form very clearly says that how to use this uh, information sheet, what are the information provided, uh, what should happen, how should they read it, uh, how they should engage with it, how they should understand, how they can ask questions. The instructions of how this information sheet has to be used is very clearly provided in the first paragraph. You can go through it. All the details of how this information sheet is used is provided very clearly. So, then the researcher has provided a very clear and easy to understand statement of the purpose of the study. So, let us read it. This research seeks to explore the career trajectories of students who received government scholarship for their medical education. Very clearly they have said that it is uh, trying to understand the career pathways that uh, medical students take. It will help the government to understand the performance of their scholarship. So, it is very clearly telling what will be done with the study findings. The government will understand the performance of the scholarship and it will also help the government improve the scholarship program. So, the, uh, there is good clarity about the purpose of the study. So, the participant clearly understands why they are participating in the study. 
Then after explaining the purpose of the study, the authors uh, talk about how they access the information about these participants. They say that we took your information from the government database, scholarship database, we have taken your information and you are being approached so that we can talk to you. So that how they approached you, that information is also being provided and then they explain the procedures very clearly. Again this paragraph I think is very important for us to read carefully. You will be requested to participate in an interview either face to face or through telephone. They mention that very clearly and then they say an interviewer will ask you specific questions about your scholarship, about your current life situations, about your job, about your experiences of holding the scholarship. So they have explained very clearly what will be the content of the interview, what all types of questions the participant can anticipate while participating in the interview. The interview will be audio recorded. The interview will be conducted only once and it may last anywhere between 30 minutes to 1 hour. They very clearly describe the entire procedure of the interview. So the participant gets a clear understanding of what all to expect if they agree to participate in the study. Then they also make a very clear description of the risks that are involved in participating in the study. This is again very important to uh, read because in the previous informed consent document, we had seen that the researcher had said a blanket statement that there are no risks involved in the study. <coughs> this is also quite a simple interview format study, but look at the details at which they have gone to describe the risks. They say, other than the fact that this interview may consume 30 minutes to 1 hour of your time, there are no major disadvantages. However, it is possible that some questions that are asked may make you feel uncomfortable. You can refuse to answer any question at any point of time, those questions which you are not comfortable answering. And you may also terminate the interview at any point that you feel uncomfortable. So here they have clearly mentioned that so even though it is just an interview, even though it is just a question answer session, there is no problem, uh, it is not free of risks. There are risks you may feel uncomfortable answering certain personal questions, in that case you can terminate the interview at that point or you can refuse to answer those questions. They have given a very clear statement. Then they also mention the benefits of participating in the study. That statement is also very important to read. They have said you will not receive any direct benefits, so there won't be any monetary compensation or any direct benefits, but the findings from the study may however benefit future recipients of the scholarship and the entire program. So they are giving the larger picture, they are saying that there are larger community level benefits for participating in this study. Then they also mention the next paragraph, they mention about confidentiality. They mention about how the confidentiality of the participant will be protected. Let us go through this paragraph. All information obtained from you and the recording of your interview will be kept confidential. They mention that very clearly. No personal identifiable information will be recorded or preserved. They say that identifiers will be delinked. Only the contents and ideas of your interviews will be transcribed. So they mention it very clearly that only the contents and the theme of your interview is important to us and not your identity. The information may be published in scientific journals. They also take permission for publication. So this paragraph is very crucial because it assures the participant that confidentiality will be maintained and only essential information and the content of the, and the theme and the essence of the interviews will be captured and not personal identifying information. Then the last paragraph again very important because it talks about complete voluntariness. It gives the various options in which the participant can exercise their voluntariness. It says you have right to withdraw at any point of time without stating a reason for withdrawal. They can withdraw at any point and it says you have right to objecting the recording. In that case, the, uh, the interviewer will only make notes. They will not record your interview. That is also being mentioned by the uh, researcher in this consent document. Then they also says, uh, the document also says you have the rights to ask questions, ask doubts and get them clarified before you participate in the study. 
So, this is how a comprehensive informed consent document looks. It has the elements, all the elements that we have seen in the previous presentation, it contains all these elements, it talks about the information in an easily understandable, understandable manner, it provides the risks, it provides the benefits, it provides aspects of confidentiality, then it has also finally provided the nature of voluntariness of the consent form. Then this is a very well structured model of the consent document. What we have seen so far is the information sheet and this is the consent document. Again you can see the consent document also very clearly provides the, the aspects of agreeing to participate voluntarily, then agreeing for recording of the interview, audio recording of the interview, then agreeing after complete understanding of the aspects of the participation in the study then understanding the purpose of the research, all these have been explicitly stated in the consent form and there is a space for the study participant to leave a signature or a left thumb impression and the date and there is a space for the investigator to sign and date. So, this is an ideal informed consent form having all the elements of information and all the ideal contents of the consent aspect of the consent form. Quickly summarizing the process of informed consent, the process of administering an informed consent involves careful consideration of three aspects. You can remember them as the three C's, competence, comprehension and complete voluntariness. All these three have to be present for an informed consent process to be considered as appropriate and complete. Then it is the responsibility of the researcher and the ethics committee to ensure that interests of the research participants are protected. Therefore, informed consent form has to be in the spirit of protection of the interests of the research participant and not in the spirit of protecting the researcher uh, themselves against future litigations. Thank you.